Welcome to this EduServe Executive Briefing Program webinar. Uh, we're talking today about data ownership and consent to share data in care services. It's a key and complex issue in integrated health and social care services. My name is uh, Joss Kreese. I'm the Principal Analyst for EduServe and I'm going to be chairing this, this webinar. I've worked across health, social care services and in local and central government for many years, much of which time was spent trying to tackle this topic. Um, if I can just hold on a second, move on to the next slide. Here we go. Um, hopefully, for those of you who are joining us, and we've got nearly a hundred um, expected to join today, so welcome to you all. You will have a chance to participate. In fact, we want this to be interactive as well as informative and informal. So, if you could uh, use the raise your hand button, if you can see that, there's a little hand in a blue blob. If you just click on that that will indicate to us that you can hear this audio. And then also you will see on your screen, enter a question. If you have questions, and, and I certainly hope you, you will have, um, enter them in that space uh, and that will alert us. You can indicate who the question's for uh, if, if, you, if you wish. There is a likelihood, given the number of people on this webinar, we may not be able to get through every question, um, but we'd still like to hear your questions because we will be doing some sort of write-up uh, from this, uh, and it will be good to understand what your what your views and ideas uh, are. So, um, let me introduce our expert panel. We are very fortunate to have four um, industry experts in contrasting and differing professional fields. We have uh, Dylan Roberts, who is Chief Digital Officer for Leeds City Council. Dylan's experience includes work on the Leeds Care Record and Ripple, a demonstrator project hosted by Leeds City Council that's building an open source digital care record platform. We also have Jocelyn Palmer, the Program Manager for Connecting Care, Bristol, North Somerset, South Gloucestershire, which is a nationally recognised and innovative health and social care program and a partnership that spans hospital trusts, local authorities, hundreds, over 100 GPs, mental health, out of hours, and community health care providers. We have as well a Dr. Emir Hanan, who is a full-time GP at the Horton Thornley Medical Center. He is very widely known uh, as a pioneer of patients having access to their electronic records. He has also met other positions, Director of Orbit Healthcare, Chairman of the West Pennine Local Medical Committee, also of the Association of Greater Manchester Local Medical Committees. He's a member of the Equality Diversity Council for NHS England and a chairman of the World Health Innovation Summit. We also have Tracy Egerton as Policy Officer, Public Services at the Information Commissioner's Office. Thank you very much. We're back with the screen. Sorry for that small interruption. These things happen on live broadcasts. So, um, uh, Stacey works with organizations across health, education, and local authorities to provide guidance uh, and a breakdown of some of the misconceptions about information governance uh, and information protection, which often gets in the way of uh, information sharing. So, welcome to the webinar. Um, the EduServe Executive Briefing Program um, sponsors a whole range of research, and on this particular occasion, uh, we want to look at integrated care, which has never been, I think, higher on the agenda. The public are demanding it. It's a stated government priority. There are enormous service pressures facing social care and also our health services. Almost daily we read about this in the press, um, <coughs> and we know that digital and data sharing offers some solutions to that. And of course, we have some major technological opportunities. But the key challenge behind all of this in my view, certainly, is data. It's about the quality of data. It's held in many different formats in many different organizations. It's about data being owned by all of us. Increasingly, our wearable technology, let alone being in control of our care records. But what are the risks and the responsibilities? And frankly, are the public ready for this? There's then the data security, confidentiality, the need to set standards and levels of control, and of course, the vexed issue of data sharing across agencies. How do we do this with so many systems and data locked into organizations and yet ever changing and ever expanding? We know that many 
national programs, especially in healthcare, have struggled. We've had care.data, connecting for health, NHS IT, just to list some of them. There's also an importance of not undermining the duty of care that health and social care professionals actually have by simply making data available to, to everyone. Um, so what should be the role of government in setting regulation, national programs, standards, policies, guidance, national strategy, whatever it is, what should be the role for government in defining these new data-driven care models in the future? And we know in particular it's going to be about trust and it's going to be about complexity. Public trust and the trust of professionals in how data is collected, in how it's stored, shared and used and avoiding the complexity where we can by not over-engineering solutions. Um, for example, care.data was, in my view, very well-intentioned, uh, but it was about electronic records, it was about a single care identity, and it was also about the need to share data for research and other purposes. That made it a highly complex and difficult to understand uh, solution, but also it was one where public trust and the trust of professionals was not gained at the outset. So, the EduServe Executive Briefing Program Research um, has looked at the topic. There are two reports you can see on the screen. They are freely available to download. Um, each of them looks at the challenge of integrated care and also the elusive digital opportunity. It's freely available uh, and there are some key findings that we came up with within that and I'm sure our panel will go through some of these points. The first is uh, we believe that place-based and user-centric care is essential in the way we design, in the way we resource, in the way we define our technology and the prioritization of programs. And that means, for example, that a concentration alone on primary and secondary health care is a mistake. We will not solve the problems of pressure on care services purely by pouring more resources and more prioritization into the very front line of those services. We need to look at care in a much more holistic view in the future. Well, that's my introduction. So let's get going by hearing from our four experts um, who are going to talk about different areas with their views and experience of the challenges and opportunities of data sharing in care. So first of all, let me welcome Dylan Roberts. Hello. Hi Dylan, over to you. Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Dylan Roberts. I'm the uh, Chief Digital and Information Officer from uh, Leeds City Council. Uh, I guess one slight difference in terms of my role is that uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have uh, responsibility over uh, not just the council but also uh, the three CCGs informatics work across, across Leeds uh, and in particular many of my objectives in my appraisal are around partic delivering particular city-based uh, outcomes uh, across our 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 partnership in Leeds. So, from a health and care point of view, I've got some particular outcomes around uh, delivering uh, on 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 better health and well-being outcomes around prevention, self-care, integration of uh, uh, health and care services across localities, and also uh, some objectives around making uh, organisation more efficient and effective across across the place which is uh, which is Leeds and also West Yorkshire which is uh, our sustainability and transformation plan area which is which is one of the uh, uh, well one of the uh, NHS England's uh, initiatives for uh, delivering integrated care so what I want to do uh, today is uh, uh, basically go through a few slides and to, just to explain some of the things that we're doing in Leeds uh, and to provide my point of view and then hopefully uh, we'll get some questions and, and a wider discussion as we go. So as, as Geoffs has al already uh, alluded to, you know, public service is in crisis. I mean, in the Leeds uh, context, the uh, the health and care gap in Leeds, and the health and care gap figures are, are, are published in lots of places. Well, the health and care gap in Leeds by 2020 is... Uh, is just over 800 million pounds and that, what that means is if we carry on delivering services as we have always carried on doing services if we just carry on delivering health and care services as we always have 
with the exponential increase in demand on those services from people with long-term conditions and, and the like, we, we will have that type of financial gap. So therefore, we have to flip our thinking altogether and think about new models of, of, of doing things. And I think it's really important before we get into any conversation, whether it's about data sharing or technology or whatever it is in this field, we've got to remember that uh, this is the means to an end, not the end itself. So I think it's really important to understand uh, the context within which we're working and from that, what some of the strategies and directions are that we're hoping to enable. So therefore, you know, what, what our approach to information sharing has to be aligned to uh, what we're trying to achieve as a, as a, as a system. Uh, so the, the, the first thing I wanted to do is just to put things into, uh, into context, really. And this is basically my base understanding, uh, which I'm happy to be challenged upon, uh, around where we are as a well, where we are right now in terms of information sharing across the health and care system. Yeah. First of all, uh, as it relates to direct care, so that is where health and care professionals, whether they're in social services in a, in a local council or in an NHS organisation, have got a legitimate relationship with a patient or a client. Uh, and they are providing direct care to that person, they have the ability to share information. In other words, they do not necessarily have to uh, ask for consent for that. That is resolved through statute, which was through the Health and Social Care Act 2015. So therefore, uh, as, as, as far as providing direct care type services, you can, through statute, share that information for those uh, uh, purposes. Uh, there are some complications around that because the latest Caldicott review talked about uh, duty of confidentiality, which is a, a health thing which links into things like the Hippocratic Oaths and all of that type of thing. I'm not going to get into all of that now, but maybe we can get into that as part of the conversation, which, which, which can sometimes confuse things. But as far as uh, providing direct care, if, if, and certainly from a leads perspective, if we're providing direct care to someone, we, we we believe through statute we are able to share information for that for that purpose. The area where we've got the biggest issue is where we are sharing data for secondary purposes. And secondary purposes is where ultimately we might be using, for, take, for sake of argument, uh, data for research or oversight. And by research and oversight, in many cases, the purposes that we would be wanting to do that in in Leeds, for instance, would be to be able to potentially identify patients or people who may be at risk so we could prioritise investments in certain parts of the city uh, based on maybe preventing uh, you know, people getting into diabetes or particular sections of care or whatever. Fundamentally, uh, the use of data for secondary purposes is where we sometimes come unstuck or have some challenges in terms of uh, uh, in terms of an ability to be able to legally share that information. So fundamentally, my understanding of what we're doing in Leeds is that uh, you know every data flow that we do in Leeds must be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And considered by who? Well, ultimately considered by the, the data controller. And from a data protection point of view, that is uh, ultimately the person who is the primary sort of uh, controller of the data or the holder of the, of, of the data. So, for instance, from an NHS number point of view, people might have heard uh, of the of, of the well, the bit of the nonsense that's been going on around uh, the, the sharing of the NHS number. Uh, you know, NHS Digital, who are a health and care organisation, are the data controller for the NHS number. So, there's been all sorts of issues around how we can share NHS number, for instance, for secondary purposes. So, uh, so yeah, so I mean, there, there, there is, and there are various models, and we can maybe get into these as part of the uh, conversation, whereby uh, we can uh, use different tools to anonymize data so that you can combine data in order to be able to derive better uh, insights in terms of how your system's working uh, and the like. However, what, what, what that can't be is identifiable. There are other techniques, of course, where you might, people might have heard of the term pseudonymization, and that is where basically uh, data is sometimes, can sometimes, for, for certain purposes, be 
uh, codified and almost anonymized, but it, it also comes with with a key, so it can be you know re-identifiable once things are, uh, uh, are transferred across. So there are different methods by which we, tools we can use to uh, use data for secondary purposes and, and, and do so uh, uh, within within the law. And I think it's also worth noting that where things can get quite confusing is that as well as uh, the Data Protection Act and things like that, which are which are clearly legal and statute, uh, what can confuse things sometimes is you you also get uh, you know outcomes from things like Caldecott review. So sometimes you get a health view on things, and sometimes you get that not conflicting with the law, but basically you get the two things side by side, and both things need to be considered. And what we've also got, which is going to uh, which is going to present even greater challenges is we've got over the horizon, we've got the uh, GDPR legislation coming forward, which is uh, which is which has come from the, the the European legislation. So a lot going on. I just thought it was important to set that baseline. But what I will say, and Dame Fiona says herself, which is that little quote at the bottom, uh, it, at the end of the day, the duty to share information can be as important as the duty to protect patient confidentiality. So I think the big thing there is is that everyone recognises we need to sort this out. Uh, everyone recognises in terms of delivering government policy, in terms of delivering the outcomes we want to deliver, uh, information sharing is, 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 is key to that. So in the LEAD system, coming back to our outcome-based approach, uh, what we're focusing on is on Bob there. And what we're focusing on is improving the health and well-being outcomes uh, for Bob. So as opposed to Bob being seen as lots of uh, different, a collection of different parts dealing with different parts of the health and care system, what we're focusing on in Leeds is, is flipping the approach really and looking at how can we enable Bob and potentially his circle of care to, to make Bob more self-sufficient uh, and frankly be able to look after himself, but in particular, when Bob actually comes into the care system, that that care system is seen as one system and we've got a combined set of information potentially of different partners around Bob so we're providing the most effective uh, care. And ultimately, when we talk about the care system in Leeds, we're not talking about traditional NHS or local government organisations alone. We're talking about a combination uh, around Bob who might be sitting in the middle there, but we're looking at a combination of families, friends, caregivers, home care workers, volunteers, etc. If you if you use Leeds as an example, uh, there are currently 92 uh, voluntary sector mental health organisations in Leeds working on different mental health, uh, different aspects of mental health, who are providing care right now. So when we consider the information sharing uh, legislation or what we want to do around information sharing. Uh, we also can't just consider health and care organisations, we have to think about arrangements for a wider set of organisations and providers and also think about arrangements whereby Bob himself in the centre of that circle of care there, uh, Bob himself might generate and hold his own information uh, and his families and friends and caregivers and the like will have that as well. So I, I think it's really important to note that this is not just about integrating health and care organisations as in social care and NHS organisations, it's about integrating that whole whole system. Uh, and the Leeds approach to that basically is that uh, is, is twofold. I think first of all, I do believe that uh, and, and as a uh, and, and Leeds believe, believe this as a whole that, that there is opportunity for simplifying and standardising and sharing a lot of what we do. One of the things we do not want to be doing is duplicating what we do in different places. So, you know, Leeds are absolutely committed to that and uh, I, uh, I link into national organisations such as the Pioneer Network for Health and Care. I, I chair a group called the Local CIO Council which has uh, information and technology uh, leaders from across the, the system. Uh, I'm linking to organisations such as your soccer teams of this world and the like. So I think and I think one of the things we do in Leeds is when we develop things, we are really keen to be able to capture those things so they can be shared in other places. So what uh, I'm showing on the screen there is that uh, in terms of our integrated digital care record 
uh, approach in Leeds. We, we have got for direct care purposes, and I think it's important to reiterate that, so for direct care purposes for which we can share information through statute of the uh, Health and Social Care Act 2015, uh, Across the lead system, in 100% of GP surgeries, in adult social care, in the community health organisation and the mental health organisation, we've got an integrated care record system whereby Bob's record is viewable across all those areas. And fundamentally, we are sharing information for direct care purposes for Bob's care. That, that has, uh, and through feedback across that system, across all, that, all those professionals, that has uh, significantly increase the effectiveness and efficiency of professionals working around Bob and Bob's care and in particular made decisions made around Bob's health and care uh, significantly improve decisions around Bob's health and care because professionals are not blind to what's going on with uh, Bob even if it's basic information such as uh, medications and, 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 and things like that those sort of things can be transformational for for uh, Bob himself in that professionals are making a more joined up decisions. Now our approach and method for doing that, we've captured that uh, in a, a set of open source type documents and capabilities actually, which is not just IT stuff. So we have got things like uh, uh, requirements for integrated care records and the like, which you can download from our Ripple program website. And some of the things we've got on there, which people can download and apply in other places, is we have got uh, guides for information sharing and we've got some template agreements in terms of information sharing agreements for, for direct care and for secondary care around uh, our integrated care record work. What we've also done in Leeds and we think that regardless of law and regardless of statute, I think, uh, and this is my, not just my opinion but it's certainly uh, something I'm pushing hard in Leeds and the Leeds system agree with, we believe it's really important that whatever you do, regardless of law and what you can and can't do, I think uh, a big lesson for us is to have that conversation with patients. So part of our Joined Up Leads initiative is that uh, you know we have had uh, multiple conversations with patients and clients. As patients turn up at GP surgeries, there's been occasion where we've had conversations with people to explain to them how we are using uh, their data and, and what we're doing with it, the purposes by which we do it, and, uh, and the like. And that, uh, in particular, the feedback from that has been quite significant in that, uh, in, in terms of our uses of data for direct care and also secondary usage to prioritise health and care services, 98.5% uh, of all our patients and clients uh, basically said that they would consent to that usage. So if you have the conversation with people in the context of their care, uh, we generally find that it, it doesn't become a problem. So I'm a real advocate of, of, of doing that. So that's just a quick overview of what we've been doing in, uh, in, in Leeds and hopefully some basis in terms of my understanding of where we are from an for, as a, nationally in terms of information sharing. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there and, and hope to get into some uh, decent conversations later on. Dylan, thank you very much for that. Um, we've already had quite a few questions through, Dylan, and uh, I have assigned them to you. So you might like to answer them. Oh, okay. Feel free to ask, answer them generally or, or specifically to those that have, that, that have asked them. If you go down the list, you'll see the, the, the chat line. Right, let's move straight on. Thank you for that. We've now got uh, Jocelyn Palmer, the Program Manager for Connecting uh, Care, Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire. Jocelyn, are you there? I am there. Hi. Wonderful. Uh, your, you, the, the screen is yours to control. Fabulous. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I'm probably going to be picking up on a, a couple of things that Dylan's talked about, but um, I think um, what I will be talking to essentially is uh, working with multiple health and care partners and also the link to um, information governance and whether or not it's a, it's a barrier to some of the more integrated ways of, um, uh, of providing care. So just in a little bit about us, so um, Connecting Care is uh, the, a 
a program which is essentially a digital program uh, across our region and it's all focused on how we can um, better share information between health and social care organizations um, and indeed other kinds of organizations such as you know potential voluntary sector and so on um, and the whole ethos behind it is really how can we make care better safer and more joined up so you can see there are a couple of quotes from people who um, are I mean, essentially reporting back on the benefits of our Connecting Care program. Um, and most of the work that we've done to date has been on shared care records. So um, you know, very similar to the work that they, they've been doing in Leeds. Um, and you can see it, whether it's talking about uh, time saving or uh, better safeguarding practices um, or safer care or actually making decisions about care. Um, it, it's, pretty, um, it's pretty obvious that um, clinicians and practitioners having information that they need um, really does support uh, better, safer uh, patient care. Um, so who are we? Um, so, so we are a, uh, a mix of all different kinds of organizations. Um, so locally, um, three acute trusts, uh, two of which are um, pretty big uh, hospitals based within the city. Uh, we've got three different community health organizations, uh, three local authorities, uh, mental health trusts, out of hours providers, GP practice, ambulance service, etc. Um, and um, the Connecting Care program is um, essentially bringing all of those different organizations together to say how can we best serve our population. So um, as, I'm, as I'm sure probably um, many of you would recognize, um, when you're working across um, partners and, and partnership um, organizations like this, then there are some quite unique challenges that maybe um, you don't have so much when you're just working within one organization. And I guess we could characterize this by, by almost calling it the, the herding cats challenge. Um, and I think that um, within um, the program, there are definitely um, political, personal, human, organizational, um, and uh, behaviors and, and dimensions. So, uh, Whilst I think that the big picture um, is of uh, NHS and a care system that's definitely under massive pressure um, and the organizations are coming together and certainly in some places um, in the country there's some really innovative Have we lost? Have we lost you, Jocelyn? Through, um, things like political dimensions between organizations. I'm still here. Can you not hear me? Just occasionally tripping you. out. Hi. Yeah, I can hear you now. Carry on. Hello. I can hear you. Yeah, I think I think maybe there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so when 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 looking to deliver a program which is about uh, whether it's a sh digital shared care record or other digital solutions around information sharing, then recognizing and working with these human dimensions are just as important as working within the uh, legal boundaries and actually the, the, the kind of formal governance elements. And I think that both of those sides needs to be tackled um, if, if you're to make progress and to, um, and to be successful. So in terms of the information governance aspects, then um, I think certainly when we started, uh, there was a perception with some of the partner organizations or just, just generally within the teams we were working with that information governance was a blocker and that everything around information governance was about not being allowed to, to share information. Um, I think that um, time has moved on since then um, and uh, I think it's definitely the case that, um, as, as Dylan referred to, that there is uh, there are legal powers um, and statute which support information sharing. Um, so it's definitely not a blocker, but that's not to say that it doesn't require work. Um, so I think part, part of our challenge, if you like, is to accept that challenge and to say that, yes, um, we do need to do the work. We need to have the conversations with clinicians, with practitioners, um, with uh, members of the public. Um, and the fact that you are doing the work 
doesn't mean it's a blocker, it's just a, a job and, and a task and effort that everybody really needs to put in. Um, I think a couple of things that, that we feel are really important and has been borne out to our experience here in the, in the Bristol area is um, having the right people collaborating and um, working with the differing views across the partnership is really valuable and really helpful. So, um, for instance, we had some um, quite innovative and different ways of thinking that came from some colleagues in local authorities um, and actually the some of the challenging at times conversations between health and social care colleagues about what was permissible, what the legal powers were, what we were allowed to do, what we weren't allowed to do um, were, um, were valuable and actually in having those conversations I think that we got to a better place and to a stronger partnership. So I think linked to that there's definitely an ongoing need for education so that so that people understand what we are allowed to do and, and clearly some of that is you know national guidance and so on but it's also about making sure that people within a project team or a program team or, or a partnership uh, are all uh, aware and, and mindful of actually what it is that we're able to do and I think also to pick up an echo on Dylan's point about the transparency, so um, really working the whole time to be as transparent. We lost you again, there, and as open as to. So. Uh, are some of the key things for us and I think uh, other areas that have um, definitely benefited from some external support and input so so we have at times asked information commissioner to to come to support to to review um, work that we were planning on doing um, and we've also asked for external um, quality assurance and advice so I think really being being open in in many ways um, and accepting that the challenge um, and recognizing that whilst it may, it may be at times hard work or feel like hard work um, that ultimately it's about um, making care better for all the people um, that live in our city and our region. So I think um, that's those are the key things that I wanted to share about um, working in partnership and information governance across the partnership um, and I think that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, apologies, we had a little bit of a, a glitch occasionally on, on the line there, but I think we got the gist of it. And, and, I, and I do think there is a, a really important here around, a, a point here about the role of the Information Commissioner's Office. And, and sometimes uh, the ICO is seen as the reason we can't do certain things. And I think you know you, you, you have made it very clear that that is, is not the case. Um, uh, and, and, and I think the support of the, the, the ICO's office for appropriate information sharing and responsible information management uh, is extremely helpful in this. So without more, more to do, let's move on to our next uh, panelist now, uh, Dr. Amir Hanan. Um, I'm not going to go back through all of your uh, background. It's on the screen there for everyone. So uh, Amir, over to you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak. And um, Although this uh, seminar is about data ownership and consent, um, I called it hash knowledge saves lives and hash empowerlution and the difference between data and knowledge. Um, I would like to thank all the patients, past and present, carers, staff, management and partners at Holton Thorny Medical Centres, Margaret, Yvonne and Ingrid, uh, patients of ours, Wendy Povey, Deborah Smith, uh, who are our management team, Glenn Griffiths, Dr Richard Fitton, Dr Brian Fisher, uh, Louise Brady, who's a practice nurse in a local practice, and Lisa Drake, who's a practice manager up in Cumbria. Sir Graham Cato, who was the uh, chairman of the General Medical Council and the General Medical Council itself. The Information Commissioner's Office, the GPC of the British Medical Association, the Medical Protection Society and Medical Defence Union, UNESCO, and of course the World Health Innovation Summit, and many, many other people have been on this journey that we've had that I'm going to share with you. But I thought we'd start first about data, because everyone's talking about data and sharing data. I'm not sure if people have actually seen what a GP record looks like. Uh, so I thought I'd start with the GP record. It's often seen as the, the richest source of data that exists in the NHS. And, and clearly, uh, for those of us watching uh, who aren't in the, in, in the UK, um, in, in, the, in the NHS, if you have any care delivered to you anywhere, uh, either in the hospital, in community services, 
every patient is registered with a GP practice and the details of that encounter are uh, sent back to the GP practice unless the patient asks for that not to happen. So often the GP record is a cradle to grave record and it contains pretty well every encounter you have. Um, here is an example, it's our test patient record for you to see what I get to see as a GP. This is EMIS Web, which is one of the clinical systems uh, that exist. Um, and you can see their code of data um, at the top in the next procedure, you can see that our test patient has had a whole load of immunizations done. And below that you can see I've had a consultation with the test patient. Um, it's a telephone consultation. You can see their problem title, familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, and that's, that's coded data, and that would be SNOMED CT coded. And then below that, in free text, um, I've got text there um, saying that um, um, about lumps and bumps around the knuckles and Achilles and so on. There's a, that's, that's free text, that's not coded. But below that it says FH colon ischemic heart DIS, clearly that's, that's coded data. And then below that, there's a conversation that's taken place. Um, and um, there's a summary of the information that was shared. Um, and, and again, in free text, and you can see there that if all you could see was the coded data, it would be pretty meaningless. But actually, by seeing the wealth of information, the concerns that the family has, uh, or that individual has about familial hypercholesterolemia, and what that might mean today or tomorrow, is hidden away in a few words within the free text, within the consultation itself. And then below that, there's a consultation about um, asthma. Uh, which is a more routine type of consultation, and some data in there, again, coded and non-coded. On the right, you can see a little box that flashes up that tells me about things that I need to be aware of, and that's the system throwing up information that I might not be aware of, things that I need to do, and that's based on the data that's already uh, embedded in it. And on the left-hand side, you can, list, you can see a, a list of problems that this patient has. Um, so it's useful for us to be aware of what kind of data we're talking about and what a GP record might look like. But if I now move on and start thinking about healthcare and the context of healthcare, I love this little picture that I found. Um, I'm, not sh I'm sorry, I don't know where, who to credit for this picture, but I think it's a wonderful picture. Because what it describes is sick care. And on the left, you can just see what I've described, what, which is what uh, <laughs> traditional healthcare systems are more interested in. And it's your medicines cabinet, it's your drugs, it's your treatments, it's what we can do for you. And on the right-hand side, you, you can see um, a, a fridge full of fruit and vegetables and things, and that's healthcare. And there's something about, you know, are we a national sick care service, a disease service, or are we a healthcare service? And the reason why this is important is because if we now look at this little picture, it shows that when you start thinking about what makes us healthy, in fact, there's only about 10% of what we do um, that, that healthcare can impact on. 20% is our genetics, so let's blame our parents for that. 20% is the environment, and more than 50% are those healthy behaviors that we have. And yet, when we think about where we are actually spending our money, over 88% of it is being spent on medical services, a little bit on healthcare behavior, healthy behaviors, uh, and, 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 and whatnot. And there's a real contrast there between the, dis the sickness service and the health service, and how can we link the two together? And that's why, oh, I can't forward the slide. That's why um, I, I say that the business end of what happens, where a lot of the really important decision making takes place, is right inside the consulting room. And here's a picture of me with Yvonne in, in, in my consulting room. And there you can see two experts. Yes, the patient Yvonne comes to me because she is expecting the best that medicine can offer and healthcare can offer. And I'm trained in terms of how to take a history, how to examine the patient, how to come up with a differential diagnosis. Um, I've got the golden pen so I can uh, refer the patient for further investigations, um, start medications and things, uh, and, and uh, refer her on. Um, but the patient is an expert because she's an expert in terms of what's been happening to her uh, up till now, um, where she's been, what sorts of things she's found out for herself, what sorts of healthy things she's tried or unhealthy things she's tried. Um, and uh, also how it's affected her family. And she's trusting me to do the best that I can offer, and I'm trusting her to tell me as much as she can. And there's a conversation that happens, and we forget that this is, the biz this is the business end. This is the unit of healthcare, if you like. But of course, I don't know her from Adam or Eve, but I've got that computer system in front of me that I was showing you earlier. And when I put her name into the computer, 
up comes her medical record with all the previous consultations, what's wrong with her medications, allergies, previous tests, investigations, other places that she's been to, other services that she's had, whether it's um, the hospital, whether it's community services, perhaps even social services have contacted me about issues that they've got. And that's coming in to me, and I can see all that information on the computer. Not only that, but if I then wonder what can I do for her, um, I can go to resources such as clinical knowledge summaries. And in the past, it used to be the map of medicine that I could look at that would provide me with information on what I can do next. And if, if, I, if I decided, or if we decided together that we're going to refer her to the hospital, I'd use something like e-referrals to see what providers there are. And that's the computer telling me about what appointments there are and where I can refer her to. Now, this is the important thing. If I can turn that screen around that I'm using at the moment and allow the patient to see the same information as what I can see, then we move into something very, very exciting. And I call this a partnership of trust. It's where the two experts in the room the clinician and the patient, and for that matter, the carer, if there is a carer as well. If we can share the same information, information between us, then very, very exciting things happen. The average diabetic patient only gets to spend about three hours a year with a healthcare professional of some sort. So the other 5,797 hours in, in a year, they're on their own, home alone often. And we need to start thinking about how we can support that patient and that family to be able to manage um, when, when they're away from the doctor, the nurse, the social worker, or whatever. Well, how do we do that? And of course, in our practice, um, we've been enabling patients to access their records for over 12 years now. But the way we've enabled them to be able to do things for themselves, rather than having to keep coming back to me again, is through the practice-based web portal, hdmt.co.uk, and I encourage you to have a look at that, and look at the kinds of information that we're providing. Yes, we've got data sharing agreements. Yes, we've got summary care record. Yes, we've got the fact that uh, pay, uh, if you turn up in A&E at the local Thameside Hospital, that um, they, they'll be able to access summary information. But the reality is a lot of my patients don't just go to Thameside Hospital, they go to the other hospitals around Manchester. And I've got patients around the world who, who are um, out and about um, um, working and all the rest of it. What happens to them? How are they able to access the same services? Because they can't leave their diabetes behind in Hyde. They can't leave their heart disease or depression or whatever it is. And we've got to start thinking about how we support care for people where they are and increasing that further afield. Which is why I think we've got a fantastic opportunity, and I call this the paradigm shift in healthcare. And I think we should get behind Jeremy Hunt and support him. This is a tweet that he put out at the beginning of this year on the 1st of January, and you can see a link there that you can, you can see for yourself. Um, but he said, 2016 is the year everyone in England will have access to their whole medical record online. But he's also noted, and in the video he's noted, that the internet has transformed our lives, but not done as much as it could in healthcare. And there's a challenge between where we are and clearly what we're doing inside our practice, and how can we spread this, not just around England and the UK, but in fact around the world. So I think there's a few issues. The first and foremost is I think we need to start thinking about how we can enable patients, every single person um, uh, on, on, well, I'm going to say on the planet, but, but definitely in, in the NHS, um, every single person to be able to access their medical records. It, it's interesting that when I was listening to the other two speakers that they talked about all the different organizations, but not very much about the people who are within those organizations uh, who, who are using those organizations or relying on them and thinking about and how we can share the information with them so that they can take it forwards. So I think there's a really important issue around how we can enable patients to access, but not just access, understand those records. I've spent a huge amount of time over the last 12 years helping people to understand what they mean. Anyone can provide a link to a web page that can allow you to see what your doctor's written, but helping them to understand it is something that I really want doctors, nurses, allied health professionals, social workers, voluntary sector organizations and everybody listening on this call to start thinking about how you can help deliver value by supporting people to understand what they're doing. And part of that is around this explicit consent process where patients actually understand what it is they're signing up for before they sign up for it. If I'm being asked, is it okay for me to look at your record? Well, how can I answer that question if I've not seen it myself? And I think that's something for us to think about is if we're building systems that allow um, the sharing of data, we need to ask the question that if we are going to ask the patient for consent, 
how have we enabled them to be in a position to be able to give real consent from an informed position? Because we know that, for instance, GP records have up to 30% of errors in them. Well, if they're sharing information there's an error in there and the patient doesn't even know that, but they've consented to it, that's not going to work and that's going to cause major problems for the system. So we need to start thinking about how we enable people to be in a position to be able to give informed consent. 6,450, in fact it's more than that. We've had another 33 patients this week sign up who've signed up to be able to view their records. But what was interesting was when care data came along, um, we asked our patient population because the Information Commissioner's Office said it was our duty as the data controllers to actually inform our patients about care data. And when we did inform our patients, 11% of them had opted out by May 2014. But for me, what was really interesting was when you looked at the ones who'd opted out, 58% of them had access to their own records and could share it with whom they liked. That was the really interesting thing, that the people that were opting out were the very people who were in a position to be able to share the information with whoever they went to, wanted, whether it was for direct care or whether it was for uh, secondary users. And in fact, many of our patients are very happy to want to share information, but they're saying, please ask us, we know what's in our records, we can see our records, we understand them, and therefore we are in a position to be able to choose whether they want to share the information or not. So they don't want to stop the sharing, but they're saying, please enable us to do it and get us involved. And then when we start thinking about, well, where's the funding being spent? Uh, we can see that over £8 million pounds are spent on care data to date, and much, much more has been spent on local data sharing agreements. I've talked about the fact that you turn up in a and &E, um, you, you know, the A&E doctors can access summary information. Well, there's been a cost attached to that that the taxpayers spent, and that's very much more than the £8 million pounds when we start to add up how much we spent around the country. But do you know what? The really interesting thing is that not a single penny has been spent on enabling patients to access their records and understanding. And I think we need to start to ask questions around where we are spending our monies and why is it that A&E departments are maxed out and full and patients and and families and communities are asking, how can we help the NHS? Well, there's something about how can we support them to be able to manage their care in the way that patients have been able to do this. And to do that, I think that we do need to support GP practices because they are, we are under huge pressures, but we also need to support the community. And the moment we start to do that, we will then start to move towards the next generation healthcare. And so my final point is, well, what's all this Empowerlution about? Well, if we sit around and wait for things to happen through Brownian motion, then that's going to be evolution. That's evolving. That will take many, many years, decades, and most people think they'll give up the ghost before that happens. There are some people who are saying, well, maybe it's a revolution that's needed, that we just need to smash the systems and start again. But that's very, very scary, and I wouldn't recommend that. I think there's something in between called Empowerlution, which is about empowering our patients, empowering our staff, and building organizations that want to empower the people around us and we start to share the data and the information so that they have a better understanding of what's going on. And that's records access and understanding. Thank you very much. Amir, thank you very much for that. Uh, we've had quite a few questions um, come in, particularly about the, you know, the vexed issue about um, having access to a whole health record, when it will happen, is it safe? Um, I've sent you some, some questions, Amir, to, to answer uh, online on that if you'd like to have a look. Um, but it, it, it is definitely a hot topic at the moment, and uh, the, the screens have lit up. So thank you very much for that uh, informative piece. Um, let's move on to our last panelist now, um, Stacey. Stacey Egerton is the Lead Policy Officer for Public Services at the ICO. Um, over to you. Hi, um, thank you very much. Um, so just to um, briefly finish um, off with that, and, um, I'm just going to cover um, a few high level um, points really from our perspective. Um, and I suppose just a little um, brief introduction um, about the, um, the kind of work that we do. Um, so I work on the um, strategic liaison department um, at the moment. 
and um, we're sort of very keen to sort of provide that um, education and knowledge to organisations. Um, so we're sort of promoting our advice and guidance really. Um, and I think the one key thing that I'd want to get across is we're very much here to help organisations. So. I mean, I suppose from my point of view, I, I would not want us to come across as the sort of big bad regulator um, that people are afraid of. Um, and that if people are sort of having difficulties um, and struggling, then we are more than happy to sort of offer assistance and help out there. So um, just moving on then to um, a bit, I suppose, about our experience with um, data sharing and, and sort of um, health and social care integration. Um, I think it, it's it's pretty fair to say really that, that data sharing is essential for health and social care integration. Um, and from our perspective as the regulator, we just want to ensure that information is shared appropriately with no privacy or information rights implications. And also I think that organisations are aware of their obligations when sharing data. I think it's a common misconception that the Data Protection Act creates the barrier to data sharing um, and I think also Jocelyn mentioned as well that IGE um, in general can be seen as a blocker to data sharing um, and that it's stopping them from, from doing it and a common example that, that we see at the ICO is that the Data Protection Act always requires you to have consent to share information and that's not always the case. Um, so con Consent is one condition for processing, but there are others, and so for Data Protection Act, you don't always need to ask for that consent, but one thing that we would promote is that you always tell individuals what you're doing, and that's the sort of fair processing and transparency. So the Data Protection Act shouldn't be a barrier to data sharing that is proportionate, necessary um, and justified and, and that's a really kind of um, key point for, for us to get across I think. So if it's not the Data Protection Act that's causing the barriers then, then what is it that is actually um, creating those, um, those issues and, and blockers and from the work that we've done across integrated care we see culture um, quite a lot as um, being one of the barriers that get in the way um, and particularly a risk averse culture. There's um, a lot of fear I think of um, fines from the Information Commissioner's Office and also I think fear of getting it wrong um, and, and people losing their jobs. And I think this is um, the, the fear of the ICO fines is particularly the case where an organisation um, may have had a security breach um, previously or received an ICO fine previously um, and that often um, comes across then I think in future practices. I think also um, there is still a lack of um, senior buy-in and support. Um, I think we come across a lot of IG professionals that perhaps feel that they're fighting the, um, the information governance battle I suppose on, on their own um, and IG um, and, re and the responsibility for information governance I think needs to be pushed up to board level um, and that's something that the, um, the National Data Guardian also um, has expressed quite strongly. And then finally there's also um, a lack of knowledge and understanding um, and this isn't necessarily within the information governance teams because obviously there's a lot of um, really great experience out there but it's particularly across other areas um, so important areas such as project management and, and IT maybe. Um, so the legal framework for, um, for sharing data within health and social care can obviously be quite complex but other teams need to be aware of um, information governance, um, especially knowing who they can go to or where they can go to for help and assistance. Um, staff training is also really, really important, I think, in, in that area. Um, so obviously sort of pushing um, that knowledge and understanding into the organisation. And if you've not got the senior buy-in, then obviously information governance is not going to be a priority. So it's all kind of interlinked, I think, those barriers, and it can be a struggle. And then finally, just on to my um, last slide, I just thought it'd be useful just to cover um, some kind of high-level um, important steps to consider or good practice 
points really from our point of view. Um, so I mean in terms of data sharing in general it's obviously really important that um, organisations know what they're sharing, who it's with and for what purposes. And I think also establishing what role everybody plays within that, so um, sort of data controller, data processor role. So in some of the work that we've done um, with integrated care systems, um, th these kind of roles can get quite complex um, and often you'll have an organisation that may be playing the role of data controller and data processor at the same time and it's just about making sure that you've got those um, the understandings there and that you've got those data processor contracts in place um, and also knowing how you comply with the Data Protection Act and, and also the common law. Um, and then moving on to privacy impact assessments. Um, privacy impact assessments are something that's really important for us and something that we've been trying to promote for quite a while. We often see them considered as an afterthought when obviously privacy should be considered right at the beginning of a project. So I think we need to move to a position where everyone is thinking right at the beginning of projects, do we need to do a privacy impact assessment and let's do one rather than has um, one been done which is quite often what we see. Um, and privacy impact assessments, they're going to help you map out your data flows and identify um, and mitigate any risks. And I think one um, last point to make on um, PIAs that are is that they're not the sole responsibility of the information governance team. I think um, a lot of the time um, it's seen that it's just their responsibility. Um, and again, um, going back to that um, point I made, it, it needs to kind of be um, pushed up the agenda. So everybody's considering, um, do we need to do a PIA? Um, so that's everybody um, within um, that's involved in, in the project and making sure I think that everyone is um, consulted as well because people are going to have different ideas of risks that they can bring to the table. And then finally, um, transparency um, and f for us this has always been a really important one. Um, public trust I think is more important. Um, than ever at the moment, um, especially with increasing public concern over how their information is being used um, and, and who it's being shared with and for what purposes. I think people are becoming more and more interested in this kind of information and the communication that you have with your patients is vital for them to be able to make these informed decisions about the use of their data and this is especially the case um, if you're using opt-outs. It's really important that they can make that informed decision when, when deciding whether to opt-out or not. And then a final point to make there is the fact that this transparency is only going to be strengthened um, with the implementation of the GDPR. Um, and, and that's it from me really. Hopefully that should uh, prompt some interesting discussion points. Um, you know, general point that information is everybody's business. Um, it's not just the responsibility of a GP, of a health organisation, of an IT professional that's looking after the systems. There, there is a joint responsibility and, and, and therein lies I think some of the challenge in knowing therefore who is accountable, who's taking risks uh, and how do we questions in and I, and I would like to pick a few out now um, if, I, if I may. So um, you will see on the screen in front of you that question box um, again. Please enter those questions. I can see them all on the screen. We have um, a lot that have come through already. Um, I want to ask. Um, <coughs> I want to ask one which um, uh, Andrew Harvey's raised um, in health and social. care there is a network of um, networks and support for strategic information government across a uh, governance across the these hang network and support infrastructure for health and social care information sharing um, I would go further than that and say how much are uh, not just patients and public, but um, um, even health informatics managers, never mind um, clinicians, of
the the re requirements of the Data Protection Act, and um, and and how we leads to come along and ask um, can can people sort of explain what um, the data protection principles are, um, and and if, if and I think if people understood them and it may became more more meaningful, then it would be much, much, if I just give a couple of examples of what I mean by that, um, the, the data, one of the principles says personal data shall be processed fairly and lawfully. Well, how are you as a patient, as a data subject, as an individual, um, going to know whether your data is being processed fairly and lawfully unless you can actually see the information about you? Um, and I can go through all the other data principles and as you go through them all, you begin to realize that actually, in order for us to fulfill the Data Protection Act, we should all be spending all our time and energies to enable those data subjects to be able to see the information, because it then becomes safer for us to then be able to handle it. Dylan, anything you'd add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess in terms of uh, support networks, uh, I think Central Health Colleagues spin some of these sort of support networks up uh, by initiative by initiative so there are networks such as the uh, health and care integration and uh, that, that shared information so if you were to go online and just type in health and care integration pioneers or, or vanguards and informatics uh, there's, there, there are websites and news items and areas where you can collaborate and they have meetings. There's a meeting in Nottingham, understand, in May, for instance, where colleagues from NHS England, uh, the IG Alliance, which is a, 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 a combination of people across the health and care system working on IG matters, they turn up to those events and they generally have presentations. You can have discussions and all of that. Uh, other, other networks that uh, go on uh, across uh, local places, so local government and uh, health, there are a set of, for the more technically minded people who are into the uh, the gubbins of, uh, of IG and cyber security and like, there are networks in every region of the country called the WARPs, W-A-R-P. Uh, there, there are other professional organisations, so for instance, there's the uh, Society of IT Managers, Soccer Team, for across local government and health, and they are linked into other networks, which are the Clinical CIO Network, CCIO Network, chaired by guy, Dr. Joe McDonald from the North East, and there's also a CIO Network for health professionals as well. Uh, so if, 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 if you search for them on, online, you can I would... Uh, Anything uh, that is done, which is good practice, like I think some of the stuff, uh, uh, you know, uh, Amir was saying, uh, you know, would, is, is really valuable. So if you've got things to share, there are there are the channels through there where they can be shared more widely. That's the place to do your, uh, to, where you can grab things uh, to reuse or, or or find links to 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 other things. So quite a lot of networks and stuff uh, in place right now. Thank you, Dylan. Can I, can I just, yeah, please do, Amir. Oh, thanks. thanks, Dylan. Uh, when we first started 12 years ago, it became very obvious that we needed to engage with our patient population. And, and that was one yeah. of the prime reasons why we set up our patient participation group, uh, okay. which is incredibly powerful, because not everyone can go down to Nottingham or whatever it might be.
they control the monies, they control the staff, they control the deployment. If a board decides that it wants its patients and the people it serves to access their records, they will then put the right investment in and direct their staff in order to do that. And so it won't be just an information governance issue, it would be a care issue. Okay, thank you. Um, really good points. I'm going to move on because we do have a lot of questions here. I'm trying to pick out some complementary and contrasting questions. One from Tracy Downs, uh, but also we've had from other, other people saying, well, look, you know, frankly, not Everyone has access to the internet. Um, what should we do about uh, you know that group of that group of people who do not necessarily want to move to all this electronic digital access for everything and own their records um, electronically? What, what do we need to do about that, D Dylan? Can I can I ask you initially, and then I'd, I'd like to ask Jocelyn as well on, on this, uh, based on what you're doing for Connecting Health in Bristol. So, quick quick response, Dylan, if I if I may, and then Jocelyn. Yeah, sure. I, I, I mean. I think this thing is, a, is, a, is another presentation in itself, but the, the quick response is that uh, digital uh, inclusion and digital literacy is a uh, is, is is critical and uh, and key. So within the Leeds context, and we are very pushing very hard nationally, uh, getting enrolling patients and clients to uh, basically be able to use the internet and get online and find information, uh, etc., around their health and care conditions or whatever is, is a significant priority for us uh, in Leeds. And, and we have uh, discovered in the work we have done, when we have rolled out uh, things like IoT, blood oxygen monitors, IoT devices, all sorts of things which measure people's health. Uh, in their homes, but we've generally found by getting them on the inf internet and connected to other people and accessing information, even if it's general information, uh, has that in itself has uh, had very positive results. So I think really important that all professionals and all uh, clients and people out there, we have a big focus in terms of getting them digitally literate. And I guess the other thing, part of that has to be uh, to give them a greater understanding about uh, what people are doing with their information and how to manage and handle uh, their information. Thank you for that, Dylan. Jo jo Jocelyn, what about your experience from um, uh, the Connecting Care program? Hi, yeah, so I, I think probably one of the things I would add here is that um, I've noticed that it's quite easy for um, people to make assumptions that um, the only digitally literate people will be, uh, you know, younger generations and so on. Um, and actually, we've just started to do some work with Southampton Hospital, who have done some amazing things with their um, patient sort of facing record, um, where, for example, in terms of uh, prostate cancer, uh, the the care that they can provide, um, much of which is being done digitally through people accessing their phones and um, their record. And, and being able to communicate with their circle of care and their doctors and nurses and so on. Um, and, and that's been of, of all ages. So um, I definitely agree that, that, that we will need to look at digital education, but I also think one of the things that, that we need to be mindful of is not to make assumptions that just because somebody is you know, X years old or whatever, that they won't want to do this because um, definitely that the learning that we've got from colleagues in Southampton is that that's not the case. Okay, um, I'd like to move on to another area now. Um, can, this can is I just what, come in? Oh, sorry. Who's that? Is that Amir? Oh, John, Josh, can I just answer that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Office of uh, National Statistics in January this year said that 89% of the population in the UK have gone online at least once in the last three months. Um, yeah. and, and that was in January this year. Uh, the second point is when I come across this, it's yes, clearly it's not for everybody, and particularly if you're severely demented or severe mental health problems, then you're hardly going to be able to go online and be able to do that. Um, but often what I found is that often people have families or people whom they trust um, who are very happy to do so. And my third point, and what I share with people, so I might speak to an 80-year-old, uh, or for that matter, a 50-year-old, who goes, oh, I'm not interested in the internet. And I say, well, you could write a letter, you could go to the post office and, 
um, get a stamp, post it, and maybe in about a week's time it might get there, and then we'll send a letter back to you. Or you might choose to send a text message, or now it's WhatsApp. And as soon as I say that, and it takes me 10 seconds, it's amazing how people start to smile and start to see the art of the possible. Um, I, I see a lot of patients who will put their mobile phone on, on, on the desk, and they don't have an email address or anything. I'll go, oh, you've got a smartphone. Um, do you Skype? Do you use Facebook? And, and often they'll have like an, an Apple phone and I'll, or a Google, an Android phone. And I'll go, oh, you have got an email address. And then they'll go, yes, I do. But actually what the issue is is people are fearful of saying, I don't actually know how to use it. So I will spend a lot of time um, getting people to go on the Google Play Store or the App Store to actually download the app because they just didn't know how to do that. And then help them with their passwords to, uh, to, 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 to be able to use it. And that wow factor of being able to use the phone, the point is the technology is already out there. We've got to change the culture of the NHS and start to have a, a can-do attitude. Okay, um, thank you for that. And, and I, I do agree with that. Um, I do think there's another factor, though, here, which is that um, online systems have got to be relevant, they've got to be intuitive, uh, and they've got to provide real and easy value to people of all ages and all positions, irrespective of whether there is a physical or mental reason why it might be difficult to access. And I, I had a question through, uh, I'm not quite sure where it was, but I had a question through from, from someone, and I made the point that you know if you, if you don't have broadband access in your area, or if systems really are not very easy to use, then you're not going to bother. You know, I know my 86-year-old mum, uh, does a lot of stuff online for her health because it's easy, but she only does it with the stuff that's easy. And frankly, it's often not the things from government, it's things from Boots the Chemist, which is relatively straightforward for her uh, to, to use. So I do think there's a responsibility on us in how we design and develop some of these systems uh, in partnership with the public that are going to use them of all ages. Anyway, I want to move on because I'd like to go back to a point uh, earlier on, we've had quite a few questions, including one from Andrew Harvey, about the Data Protection Act. And, and so this one is um, for uh, Stacy, please. Um, the general gist of the question is, we've got the Data Protection Act, but why, why don't we upgrade the Data Protection Act to embrace things like privacy impact assessments uh, and indeed uh, GDPR? Uh, so I wonder, what, what's, your, what's your view about the general data um, protection regulation, updating the Data Protection Act, and bringing in things like privacy impact assessments um, into, uh, in, in, into the statutory obligations for, for the public and private sectors. Stacey. Yeah, um, I wondered where that question um, was going then, but I'm glad, obviously, um, you made reference to the, uh, to the GDPR. Um, yeah, I mean, the GDPR is obviously um, a sort of quite a, a big piece of um, legislation and we're obviously um, in the stages of, of going through it in, in some detail. Um, there are things in there that are, um, that are still the same and there are things in there that are slightly different and that are going to require organisations to, to do things differently. Um, and obviously we've been promoting privacy impact assessments now for quite a while um, as part of um, good practice, um, well they obviously haven't been mandatory and the fact that now um, the GDPR makes reference um, to privacy impact assessments I think we could only see as, as a positive given the fact that we have already been um, it, it sort of suggesting these anyway um, and, and as I sort of strongly made reference to in, in my sort of introductory points, privacy is, is so important um, to consider right at the beginning of a project and I think now that um, the GDPR has kind of um, put this on a, on a legislative standing, um, I think it will kind of force um, the hand almost um, at and it will help to push that up the agenda and make organisations um, a bit more privacy minded I think and, and the fact that they do now need to start um, really thinking about this. So yeah, I think, I think we see it as, um, as definitely a positive. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to uh, move on now to a slightly different area that's cropped up. We had a, um, a councillor, um, David Hopkins, a councillor, uh, asking a question about the challenges facing local government in particular. So he's making the point that um, as a local councillor, he's faced yet again 
with huge financial challenges in the forthcoming budget round. And he wants to know, how is data sharing between their social care and the partner NHS bodies actually going to improve outcomes, but also improve efficiencies, to be blunt, saving financial resources for all, all concerned. So, you know, the philanthropic bit about doing better things for clients, for patients, we're all agreed about, we need to know how to do it, but he's making a very good point that actually at the end of the day there's not enough money, we have to find cuts. How can we make this uh, into a business case? Um, who would like to go first on my panel uh, for this one? Well, I, mean, I, I don't mind. Oh, go on. Yeah, go on, go on Dylan. Okay. Yeah, um, uh, Dylan is just coming in now. So, uh, yeah, I mean, from my, uh, my perspective, there are significant uh, business cases to be drawn up from uh, information sharing. I think in terms of, uh, you know, the evidence within uh, Leeds itself, just from basically uh, someone coming to a cancer clinic, for instance, in uh, Leeds Teaching Hospital and uh, having a situation where the consultant actually has got the correct doctor's address, GP address, as opposed to what was in the originating system because they've got access to Leeds Care Record. Things like that means that you're providing more efficient and effective care, so the time it takes for people from a direct care point of view uh, to, to deal with some of those things are, are significant. Further, uh, the ability for organizations, public health organizations, for instance, which are in uh, uh, local authorities, for instance, one of the things health, the, uh, the NHS are really good at is uh, codifying everything they do. So uh, the ability for people to, uh, you know, collect that codified data to ultimately understand where, uh, you know, particular conditions or issues are more prevalent and as a result of that prioritise uh, scarce funding in terms of maybe campaigns around prevention or whatever to particular areas and things like that, uh, you know, there are, there's, there's, there's significant, I think, efficiencies that can be uh, done and in particular, uh, I would suggest as well that in terms of flipping the thinking from a, from, from a prevention point of view, uh, the uh, opportunity to connect patients with support groups and things like that through information sharing uh, is 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 also significant in that it should uh, you know help to uh, divert the tide of people coming into the system and helping people to live better lives basically. So so I mean there there are significant business I'd say there's significant and multiple business cases for both direct uses and secondary uses. Thank you, uh, Dylan. Um, Amir, I think you wanted to come in there. Yes, um, I, ju I just wanted to say that the costs in the system start to happen when people start pinging around. So if a patient can't get into the GP surgery and then turns up at the walk-in centre or rings up 111 and then goes to a walk-in centre and then goes to A&E, and then comes back to the walk-in centre. That's where the costs, and of course, if they ask for an ambulance as well at the same time, then it's just putting more uh, injury to insults or whatever it is. Uh, my, my focus has always been on do the right thing there if you can with the patient directly. Give them the information, help them so that when they walk out of the room, they've got a bit more of an idea of what they can do for themselves, supported by us. Now, the minute we start thinking along those lines and start thinking about patients as not being people with needs, but rather patients being assets and the community being an asset and people who can actually help themselves, then we move into a very, very exciting space. And, and that's where I became the chairman of the World Health Innovation Summit, which is all about inspiring communities because every health and social care organization on the planet is struggling uh, as costs continue to rise and we continue to talk about digital technologies and things, which are MRI scans or whatever it is. But actually, the real innovation is, is thinking about what people, what families, what communities can do. And if we can just even 5% nudge people to be able to do more for themselves, there's a huge return on investment for us. Um, even for those data sharing things that we're talking about, people will want to share the information because they know what's being shared about them. If we don't do that, you lose trust, and that's what happened with care data. 
Good point. Um, would uh, Jocelyn and Stacey, do you want to come in on that one? Hi, yes. I, I guess um, it's, it's Joss here. So um, I would say that just to the point about um, local authorities and some of the pressures on, on them and, and within social care, um, I would say that through the um, shared information and, and digital shared care record work that we've done, we've definitely got demonstrable evidence of the fact that cost savings can be made which would obviously kind of hugely important at this uh, at this time so whether that's in terms of um, information sharing supporting better triage not duplicating effort not duplicating interventions um, you know not providing certain kinds of care when other people are already doing it etc so we, we've definitely found that evidence and I think that the potential is there that information sharing can can actually help to support the, the economic and financial pressures but um, I think probably um, there is a, a challenge within that in that oftentimes what it does need is teams of people and practitioners to actually work differently um, and sometimes that can almost be harder than the, uh, the information sharing or the, the digital aspects of things. Yeah, good, good point. Um, <laughs> I'm going to move on then. Um, I had a, another question here. Um, Many patients initially deny their illness and don't want to be reminded of support groups, so consent for secondary sharing should be detailed and opt-in. Um, opinion from um, Chris uh, Frith. Uh, I'm not sure if that's Frith or Firth, so apologies. I think it's Frith, but um, uh, Amir, do you have a view on that one? Yeah, I completely agree that, um, that, that there should be explicit consent. Um, interestingly, um, the, the, the trigger for me about why I went down this route was seeing a patient who came in with diabetes and me asking him what did they think about how their diabetes was and they said it was fine and I didn't really understand what fine meant because it wasn't something that I'd been taught at medical school um, but this patient had terrible control of their diabetes, it was off the scale they hadn't ordered any of their prescriptions for the last 10 months, they hadn't been to any of their checks but of course they were fine because they weren't taking any medications, they weren't getting any side effects and they felt wonderful about everything. Um, which is where I started to think about this person thinks they're fine but they don't actually know what risks they're taking as a result of that. Um, I've come across lots of patients when they're given a serious diagnosis like diabetes and they start thinking that they're going to lose their legs and um, their eyesight and they're going to have kidney transplants and whatnot. Um, they, they go into shock and often in that, in that period of time of shock, they just can't take anything in. Um, and that's a very critical time that I have as a GP to support them whilst they're trying to stabilize themselves. It might not be a year or two. And what I've found is patients who've accessed their records now, um, it's only sort of maybe two, three, four years down the line when they've got their head around what's going on and they're in a place to be able to start to think about what it means, that they can go back and they can look at previous consultations that they've had with their doctor or nurse when they're ready for it. I think that's a really, really important point that you don't suddenly, just because you've got access, it all sorts itself out. But all the jewels lie in that record from the moment that you, you joined. Uh, and, and when people start to look back at things, they can learn from that, learn from their experiences, good and bad, and then start to understand what that means for them now and into the future. And it, it seems to me, um, Amir, that there, there, there is an issue here, and I, this, this has cropped up before. It is very easy and simplistic to say patients need to be in control or, or, or citizens need to be in control of their, their care records. They determine uh, what they can view. They should have access to everything, and they can share whatever they want uh, wherever they, they, they agree. But you, know, you raise an important point, it seems to me, that there are times where it is not in the individual's interest to allow aspects of their record to be uh, to be shared, so there is a judgment that clinicians and practitioners need needs to make. So you know, see, seeing the result of a test before a practitioner has had a chance to talk to you about it may not be in their best interests. Uh, you know, what's your view, um, Amir, on, on that particular okay. point? So there's, there's two things. It also may not be in the best interest of the patient when the GP is on a webinar and the results are on the computer system. Um, but the GP hasn't had time to look at it, so it's a double-edged sword there. And then actually, as patients start to begin to understand their records better, and many of them know it as well as I do in terms of that particular condition because that's what happens over a period of time, well, why can't you look at your test results 
And why can't you um, determine what it might be about? Because there might be something serious there that could save your life. So long as, one, you've got the consent, so you, you understand what risks you're taking, but you're looking at information that your doctor might not have had a chance to look at. And two, you've got some understanding of what to do about it. I think, and the other thing is um, that I never talk about patient control uh, of the record. It's nonsense. I've never heard a single patient, and I've got thousands of them accessing their records. Not one of them has ever said, I want to control the record. So, mm. so that doesn't make any, and, and the other reason it doesn't make sense is because all of us going to die one day. Well, you know, sitting there saying, I want to control my record when I know I'm going to die just doesn't make any sense. So I, I don't talk about control. I do talk about a feeling of control, and that's different. It's that feeling. Actually, what people want to feel is that they're being cared for, that that person's listening to them. We, we seem to have lost the art of listening. Uh, yes, we can do a consultation. Yes, we can go into a waiting room and talk to a couple of patients and think, therefore, we, we've consulted with them. But actually, what we should be doing is listening, and that should be part and parcel of every single encounter that we have. When we do that, we move into very exciting spaces. And I think that's a great place to finish our panel discussion. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. My, my apologies to some of you whose questions haven't uh, yet been uh, been answered. I want to thank uh, all of you who joined this webinar because we had some really good and in-depth questions for our panelists. I also want to thank our panelists for giving up their time to to join what I think is an important debate. You know, we haven't solved all the world's problems here, but I think we have gained a particular insight from some very different perspectives uh, of the ways in which we need to tackle this problem, both in terms of policy, but also, as Amir was just closing on, philosophy, culture, behavior, as well as the underlying technologies that can make it all possible. So I want to thank you all very much for joining us uh, today. I hope you enjoyed that, uh, and I hope you will join us on future webinars. Thank you very much indeed.